Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. Today I'm here to talk to you about the library's recently completed Mining Marsden project. This project set out to create the Marsden Online Archive, which was officially launched on the 6th of November, so fairly recently. This presentation will cover the different pieces of the Mining Marsden puzzle. Um, in order to create the Marsden Online Archive, we had to complete four very important steps. This included determining the researcher's requirements, generating metadata for our content, digitising the manuscripts, and developing the online platform. But first, a wee bit of background. Who was Marsden? The Reverend Samuel Marsden, pictured here, uh, is one of New Zealand's earliest missionaries and was instrumental in the introduction of Christianity to New Zealand. Here you can see him delivering the first Christian sermon back on Christmas Day in 1814. But Marsden brought more than the Christian message to New Zealand. He also taught Murray the art of agriculture, he imported sheep to New Zealand, and he was one of the first to document the Murray language. Dr Hocken, the founder of Hocken Collections at the University of Otago Library, came across Marsden's letters and journals when he visited the offices of the Church Missionary Society in London. Realising the importance of these historical documents and their significance for New Zealanders, he managed to secure the material and they form part of the founding collections at the Hocken. December this year will mark 200 years since Marsden's first sermon. The Marsden Online Archive was created to coincide with these bicentenary celebrations. The archive makes Marsden's letters and journals, as well as those of other missionaries, available to the public. In order to have the collection online by December, we had to limit the initial scope. So we just include documents um, from the period of 1808 to 1823, which coincides with the arrival of Henry Williams. This totaled 599 letters and journals. The first iteration is just a pilot, um, but it has created a model that we can use to add additional material later. This is retired associate professor Gordon Parsonson. He has been a very key figure in this project and is one of the Hawkins' oldest researchers and donors. He has been visiting the Hawkins since 1947. Gordon first read Marsden's papers when he was accidentally locked in the stacks in the early 1950s. <laughs> we have a web page on the site dedicated to Gordon and there is a video of him talking about how he first found the material. It's a gorgeous wee video and I encourage you to watch it. Over the years Gordon has transcribed almost all of the documents, not just the Marsden papers but all of the Church Missionary Society records that are held at the Hocken. Gordon started this task by hand and has more recently been using a laptop. He's very generously given us copies of these um, transcripts to use in the Marsden Online Archive um, and he's also agreed to make these copies available to other researchers under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike Agreement. So as long as he's attributed as the author of the transcripts, other researchers are free to use them. Mining Marsden was a collaborative project between the Centre for Research on Colonial Cro Culture, or CROC, and the University Library. <laughs> this was important as their digitisation projects need to be research-led. It is because of this that one of our first questions we had to answers, answer was, what do researchers want to be able to do with the site? I was part of the team responsible for determining the research requirements for the interface. We met with several academics and researchers at Otago, as well as researchers from other institutions and some of our postgraduate students. We needed to find out about the type of functionality that researchers would need. Some researchers found this a little bit difficult, so we used pre-existing sites and um, used them as examples. However, when we asked, would you like the Marsden Online Archive to be able to do this? The answer was typically yes. As well as meeting with researchers, we also met with representatives from several other organisations. These are people who had recently set up digital archives. 
This include people from the National Library, Victoria University and Canterbury University. They were incredibly helpful and they gave us some really good advice that we were able to follow along the way. This entire process resulted in us having 60 business requirements and this ranged from ideas for the URL to advanced search functionality and TEI markup. For the first iteration, we wanted to be able to give researchers a digital space where they could replicate some of their analogue research techniques. We wanted them to be able to do what they've always done, but in a digital way. We then added value to their process by adding functionality that they wouldn't have typically had access to, such as keyword searching. Some of the researcher requirements were for specific filters and advanced search options. This meant that a significant amount of effort had to go into generating the metadata. Gordon did an amazing job of transcribing this material, but what he hadn't transcribed was all the additional metadata at the top of the manuscripts. Information such as the ship the letter was sent on and the date it was read at committee needed to be captured. This is the information that the researchers needed us, told us that they would need to have access to and be able to search on. A spreadsheet was set up to capture all this information. We call it the master index. This had all the data from Harkana at Archives Catalogue and it in turn set about populating the missing information. All of the documents were examined individually and the metadata recorded. We took this opportunity to measure all of the manuscripts so that users would have an idea of the physical size even when they were looking at the digitised material. Once all of this information was captured, we handed it over to a metadata and indexing developer. A tool was created that we call ASMIC, that stands for Automatic Content Extraction and Metadata Creation. All of the data was ran through this tool before it was uploaded to the site. This tool takes all the files that we gathered, the transcripts, the master index and the images and creates all of the outputs required. It produces a unique metadata combination, a METS wrapper with mods, mix and TEI and it does this for each individual page as well as the item as a whole. When the TEI is created it will automatically, automatically add in the markups for corrected words, alternative spellings, underline and cross out, dates, peoples, ships, key terms and places. This is done across the whole letter or journal and is added to both the METS file and is available as a standalone TEI file. The tool also creates an HTML file that is used for each page of the transcript as well as a text file. The HTML is used to display the transcript online and the text file is used for solo searching and indexing. It also creates a PDF metadata sorry, a PDF metadata file for people who aren't accustomed to reading XML, as well as a Chicago A-style citation that we display on each item page. It then puts all this information together in a folder structure that allows items to be bulk uploaded to the site. We created this tool in-house because we couldn't find any pre-existing products that would complete all of these steps for us. Using this tool significantly reduced the amount of human intervention required to make this information discoverable. However, as you can see, we in order to create a metadata, we had to employ a mixture of both manual and digital approaches. I mentioned that the TI markup adds in um, alternative spelling tags. Researchers told us that the archive would need to allow for alternative spelling. This is because some words have changed significantly over the past 200 years. This is particularly true of Murray words, as these were historically spelt out phonetically. This was done by creating a master list of words that were spelt incorrectly and then manually adding in the corrected spellings. Although this is a significant amount of effort, it's extremely valuable because it means that the archive can bring results even if the user has typed in the modern day spellings. Digitisation was a significant part of the project. It took five and a half months to capture and edit the 3,728 images required for the site. 
The digitisation team used a camera because of the fragile nature of the manuscripts. The entire process was designed around making sure that the item was moved as little as possible and as well as making sure that images were as consistent as possible. The team did a lot of testing to make sure the setup was right. One of the main considerations was getting the lighting set up. Once this was set up, it was marked on the camera stand so if ever, anything was bumped or moved, it could be shifted back. The team also looked at getting the exposure correct and sorting out colour cast issues. Having a specific setup that was well documented allowed for the transition between staff. We had two staff working on digitising for the project. This process can then also be replicated for other similar projects in the future if needed. The team set up a monitor with live view to help make sure the images were in frame and straight and so they less, required less cropping. This made the process a lot easier. For all their testing, colour cast still created issues. Colours were reflected off surrounding objects in the studio, such as blue room dividers and even off brightly coloured clothing worn by the person operating the camera. The room dividers were covered up and the team decided that nothing too psychedelic will be worn during shooting. Light reflection was another issue during the process. Shiny metal light fixtures in the ceiling had to be minimised. As well as this, the main room lights had to be off during shooting. As there were 3,728 images, batch, the team batch edited it as much as they could. They used Photoshop CS6 Extended for the editing process, as this could handle the raw files that were created by the camera. This was also useful for setting up colour profiles for batch colour corrections as well as tweaking shadows and highlight. Cropping and straightening of the images unfortunately had to be done manually, one image at a time. This couldn't be automated as all the letters varied widely in size and with the journals as the pages were turned as they digitised, the spine started to drift. Once all of the editing was completed, the team then ran a bulk renaming tool so that all the files were named based on their archival number. The files that were then uploaded to a uh, file share for the development team. And needless to say, the editing part of the process took up the most time for the digitisation team. It was then up to the development team to bring all of this information together and put it online. The Marsden Online Archive platform is made up of Fedora Commons, which is the back-end repository used to store and manage all of our digital material. Islandora, which brings together the different layers of the platform and is used to manage our different content types. Drupal, which provides access to the site through a front-end access <coughs> layer. And Solar, which does the searching and indexing. This platform was selected so it could be used as a pilot for a digital asset management system. This was a fantastic opportunity to upskill our staff on these technologies which were still relatively new to us. All of the software is open source. We took this out of the box platform and customised it for our own needs. Over 72 customisation and configuration changes were made to the platform and three staff worked full time and one part time developing for the project for nine months. One of these customizations is the on-screen transcript viewer. Researchers wanted to be able to display the transcript and the manuscript side by side so they could read both simultaneously. This is one of the biggest changes that we had to make to the Islandora and Drupal code. Another example of the extended functionality that had to be created is the highlighting of search terms. This alone took a week of full-time development effort to customize. However, it's well worth the time as it helps users identify where their search terms are appearing. We wanted researchers to have instant access to all the facsimiles that we created. There are 10 file types that are available, including a high resolution TIFF images. Researchers can also go into a page view and just download a clipping of an image. There's also functionality to email a link to a letter or even a particular page of that letter and researchers wanted to be able to email the images and transcripts directly from the site, so we have enabled this. When we talked to students, they wanted a citation that they could use in their essays and reports. 
For the Mars and Online Archive, we have generated a Chicago A style citation, as this is the style that is used by a history department. So where to from here for the site? There's still plenty of possibilities in terms of functionality, and because this, this is just the first iteration, there is still some work to do. One of the things that we've already identified is creating account functionality. This will mean that users can log in, save their letters to a favourite list, add notes and tags, and then share their commentary with other users. We've also identified that users may wish to bulk download files from multiple letters or journals. This is particularly true of users who wish to use the text files to run their own algorithms on. Beyond 2015, we've discussed functionalities such as crowdsourcing the transcription of material. We were lucky enough to have the transcripts for this project, however, for future projects this may not be the case. And there's also the potential for geolocation tracking and spatial storytelling. This is because, where possible, we've already added in the geo coordinates to the metadata. So here's the web address. Most of you probably got a business card as I popped around earlier. Um, I encourage you all to have a look at the site. We are incredibly proud of what we've achieved in a year. Um, and also, there's a hashtag, so if you want to tweet about us, feel free to. Does anyone have any questions? Did you say that the, um, the original transcripts were done by hand? So they went down into a computer, is that right? Um, he started them by hand, but then he went back and typed oh, them up so as well. Oh, so he went and did that. Yeah. So you didn't have to worry about those? No. Oh. Yeah. no. Uh, it's a very excellent project. Um, I wonder, though, when I look at it, that you built it around the original manuscript letters, rather than built the website around the transcription links to the images, but that would really be far more useful for people coming to grips with the intellectual content uh, that was talking about. So if you're looking at a, <laughs> the contentious question of how much Maori Marston actually understood, mm. um, you do a keyword search, you've got beautiful keyword and context display of results, but then you go to the letters and you've got to click again to look at the transcript you've got the transcript sort of matching the original manuscript down the page instead of, you know, if you focused it on the transcript rather than on the original, it would uh, be much better if that's the research. Okay, thank you. I was just interested in your technology stack and going forward using it as a dams for mm -hmm. the library. How much further development and support will you need for that? Because you, you said you had three full-time and one part-time for nine months. Yes. So just for business as usual in the library as a dam, will you need much more development and how much support? Um, there will be another project to uh, create the dam. So we've created Marsden as a pilot and we can use the same backing technologies. But there will be obviously an administrative interface that will have to be created. Um, but we're hoping after that the, the business as usual upkeep should be minimal. Um, but then again, moving to Fedora 4 in itself is going to be quite a significant project. So um, the, the team are very excited to take on those challenges anyway. So it should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that open source as well, the tool that you created? Uh, it's not, but um, it could be. <laughs> cool. I'd be really, really yeah. interested in, in... Yeah, in we're happy to share it. We really are. Um, and it will go up on GitHub, I'm sure. But cool. um, it, we're just not quite there yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. And the other question I have is around the... Is there like a, a data view of of the, what you've created? So I guess the TEI mm -hmm. is kind of like that. So you're exposing the the XML markup of the, of the document. Is that right? Like this... There's kind of HT, there's pages. Yes. And then, but can the public get at the at the data view, or does the public just get at the? I mean, most people will just want to get at the the, the beautifully yeah. marked up search. Yeah. So you have all your downloads on the item page. Mm -hmm. We have also enabled um, 
sorry, the acronyms escaped me, but we've been harvested by Digital New Zealand, so all that information is can be extracted. Cool. And we also have clean text files that James talked about earlier that you can download from directly from the site. Um, but as yet, we haven't enabled that, you know, interaction with the back end stuff. But we do hope to. Cool. It's a really awesome project. Oh, thank you. Kind of along those lines as well as actually pushing up all of those XML files and stuff into a GitHub re repository. Yep. That way people can bulk download the whole kind of thing so you don't yep. need to bother building an API at least as a first, yep. first attempt. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Yep. <laughs> um, following on from probably both John and um, Brian's question, if you are considering to be a dams, um, the big thing that seems to be missing, and I, I don't actually see this in any um, sort of system that's out there, but then I haven't really looked, probably. Um, but it's a, an ability to uh, display a hierarchy in a sensible way. So you've got a collection here of letters, journals, bits and pieces of other things, uh, papers, um, but there's no hierarchy where you can display letters, and then this is a, a leaf of a letter, and, and these letters in a, a chronological sequence, or letters mm. to someone, or letters from someone. And I think when you're putting an archive on, online, I'm assuming your archive is arranged uh, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's just a big pile, I don't know. But, um, but have you had any thoughts about how you can address that, that um, hierarchy and um, displaying the context and relationship of the items. Yeah, so based on the archival structure there are six folders I guess that these items related to um, and we have left that out for now um, but we're hoping with Fedora 4 that will be captured within Fedora. It's certainly a lot better than, at capturing it than what Fedora 3.7 is so um, we, we do have that information captured, it's just not enabled on the site in any, any way. Um, but you can certainly search by all those things, you can search by letters or journals, you can search by um, the ship and the, the authors and everything, so you, you can drill down that way, but we haven't done sort of a browse by that kind of hierarchy yet. Congratulations, it's, it's a great project. I'm just wondering, um, with these kind of one name archives, the expectation is that maybe other Marsden content that's in other institutions or private hands even, mm -hmm. might be able to be discovered there. Mm. Um, and you know, in New Zealand we've got you know, those sorts of challenges with you know, James K. Baxter material or Frank Sargeson or you know, all sorts of named uh, figures who mm. are represented in lots of different institutions. So um, is that something that you see maybe happening longer term? Most definitely. It was always our intention to reach out and include information where possible, or even link to it. Um, but it just, it, we ran out of time. <laughs> stage one, I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just on that topic, I think it's a useful thing for us to think about an NDF really, because the National Library's just released or releasing their digitization strategy built around is it collect, connect and co-create. It's that connect bit that I don't think we're doing very well yet at the moment. Mm. Is that we're creating things individually as institutions and we're not connecting them up very well. So um, I think that's a good thing for us all to think about. I agree. Just a lady at the back. Um. My question is based on an assumption, I'm not sure is correct, but um, Fedora is not a long-term preservation system, is that right? I guess it depends how you use it. Um, so, I guess basically my question is, do you have long-term preservation plan and technology in place for it? And uh, as a side to that, have you considered um, how you'll meet your legal deposit requirements with the project? Gosh, hard questions for a business um, analyst. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I, I do know that they are storing the preservation quality images within Fedora, and that is their intention. Um, I'm not sure the implications of that long term. But um, I can give you contact details to someone who will be able to answer that question more thoroughly for you. Probably want one more over there. Just one. Okay. So the thing on the, so the connection thing is a, a really good thing, but I know you've chosen like a non-commercial license yes. on that. Was there any reason, is there kind of reasonings behind that? 
I, to, I, just kind of to try limiting the connections between organisations. So. Yeah, I, I guess it's just to stop people making money off it. We're happy for people to use it, and we're happy for people to share it, and it's just don't sell it on. <laughs> um, but I guess that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Cool. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.